Hello folks and welcome back to English 403, 503, Digital Rhetoric, Discourse and Culture with me, Dr. Matt Barton. And in this lecture we'll be covering Jenkins, uh, Henry Jenkins, a couple of his books. I'll just show them here to you. Now I highly recommend that you read these. I know the video was, was fun, but you know if you like the video, you're going to love these books because he dies a lot more, goes into a lot more detail. Now you might have seen these books in other classes, they're pretty popular, uh, just for the general public actually. Uh, they're good airport reading, airline reading, <laughs> airplane reading, uh, convergence culture. And this, when did this one come out? I think this might, yeah, 2007, I guess. Uh, Where old and new media collide, and a little more recently, uh, spreadable media, creating value and meaning in a network culture. He's got a couple of co-authors on these, and just two. He's done other books, but he's he's a pretty well-known scholar and commentator on, on all things uh, digital. You start, talk, <laughs> start talking about digital rhetoric. Uh, you know, the name Henry Jenkins will come up relatively quickly. You know, how, how is the, all this stuff changing our culture? How are we different today? How is life, in America at least, different today than it was back in uh, 1995 or even 2005? I mean, we're, uh, I think sometimes... Uh, we're kind of oblivious because we're kind of in the middle of it. But all these huge changes taking place all around us. Uh, so the thing I like about Jenkins is he kind of gives us that big picture view. Now you can agree, disagree, that that's fine. But, uh, you know, the key, I think, is just to be thinking, you know, trying to make ourselves a little more mindful and aware of all of this, all these changes. Not just, techno not just technology, but culture. Okay, so he's got a lot in this video, and we could you know, talk about this for hours, but... Uh, I'll try to speed through it and just kind of give you the, the highlights or some of the more necessary background info you might need to really uh, fully grok, if you will, uh, Jenkins. And part of his argument has always been this shift from Web 1.0 or the old web uh, to Web 2.0, which this is kind of a dated concept these days, but it was, it was a pretty significant break, and it was one that I lived through. Uh, this is really... You know, when I was in college, it was when we were making this transition from Web 1.0 to Web 2.0. And what that meant was that uh, when I was in college, I, I went to college in 1995 was when I started. And yes, you know, you might hear a little bit about the Internet here and there, but you know, it was this very academic, very really geeky thing. It's like something computer folks did. <laughs> uh, it didn't seem to have much to do with real life uh, at all, right? I mean... It's just this sort of very, you might use it if you went, if you were working on a research paper and you wanted to pull some data from you know, some kind of government uh, organization or whatever. Uh, but it was, let me just put it this way. Uh, it was always kind of a big deal, and you'd hear it on the news. They'd actually cover this on the mainstream news. And when they'd say, some, uh, you know, Ketchup Heinz, I remember this one, Heinz Ketchup Company has a website now. <laughs> it's like, wow, why does Heinz uh, need a website just for ketchup? You know, isn't this bizarre? Isn't this like, like a sign of the times? Even, you know, this ketchup company is, has this uh, website. There's a lot of news about, you know, <laughs> along those lines. <laughs> kind of like, gee whiz, why are these people worrying about, you know, putting information on this website? And how are you ever going to make any money from any of this? Uh, people are just very skeptical. They didn't see how it applied to you know, again, everyday life at all. Uh, and part of the reason for that was just the difficulty involved. Right? So if I wanted to put, you know, I had a good friend of mine uh, in college who was a poet, and it was a really big deal. She was very, I guess, uh, tech savvy because she was able to put her poems, she's able to make her own website and uh, put her poems up on that website. And everybody that she told about this is just like, wow, that's incredible. <laughs> you know, you must, I didn't realize you were like so te technologically advanced. <laughs> uh, and it really was. I mean, you know, back then she had to know about this HTML tags and even JavaScript. And, you know, it was just not something for everybody. You know, you really had to be dedicated. Uh, it took a lot of, uh, you know, education. She had, she had to educate herself on how to do all that stuff. And it was impressive. Uh, but as time went on, it got to be easier and easier to do that sort of thing. Uh, GeoCities here. It's kind of a flashback at a GeoCities. There was another one, Angel Fire. And a lot of these kind of uh, websites started coming out, web companies. 
And what they would do is it kind of give you an easy way to make a website just so you could get some content up online. You know, a lot of people would use them for weddings and things. You have like a wedding site or a baby <laughs> website for your uh, your kid or something. Kind of celebrate uh, events and things or put poems on them, you know, as I said. Uh, so that started to get easier to do. And, of course, MySpace came along and it uh, had a lot of uh, to do with music, a lot of amateur Music artists were using that, you know, to get their band, promote their bands and follow their favorite bands and so on. <laughs> uh, so the reason those sites took off was that you didn't really have to know this coding anymore. You, know, you didn't have to, it probably would help, you know, if you knew like HTML tagging and everything. Uh, but it was really increasingly less necessary that you really be technologically savvy uh, to put something online. You know, by the time you get to WordPress, you know, and these, these blogs, part of what made them so appealing was just about anybody could do it. If you, knew how to, if you know how to use a Microsoft Word, it's a very small step from that to working on uh, WordPress and actually publishing things online. You didn't need to know about servers. <laughs> you didn't need to know about, uh, you know, uh, domain names and all this stuff. Uh, it really kind of lowered that barrier to entry, let, let more people participate. Uh, so that's what we're talking about here. Uh, Web 2.0 and collective intelligence. So a lot of, uh, if you read O'Reilly, he talks about this, one of the earlier ones. Uh, one of the examples he gives always stuck with me was Amazon. And they, the argument was one of the brilliant things that Amazon did was um, instead of just having experts or their own people rate products and review products, uh, they just let anybody come on and post a review <laughs> you know like rank things like i'll give it three stars four stars whatever and they found that was a great move because it kind of tapped into this collective intelligence right so all these just regular folks with different kinds of experiences using these products for different purposes it really uh you know helps sell content and get certain productions certain books i guess at that time <laughs> there was a point when amazon just sold books <laughs> Uh, but it could kind of make uh, make or break you, right? It wasn't just about, and you know, that was just all these regular folks rating and reviewing books, not just the editors at the New York Times, you know, let's say making those decisions. So that, that was really a cool example. Uh, but again, yeah, you make all the content, they keep all the revenue. <clears throat> if you're not paying for it, you're not the customer, you're the product being sold. And I still hear people say this. You know, I remember Facebook, I mean, I won't even get into all the stuff, all the controversy. Oh, my goodness. Uh, oh, wow. Uh, but, but even back at, you know, when Facebook was new, uh, there were people that were very skeptical of this. Like, well, if they're not, so you don't pay, uh, you know, they're not charging you to use Facebook. You know, this was kind of a strange concept, and it made people very suspicious, you know, and for good reason, frankly. Uh, you know, as it turns out, they're using, they're, you know, compiling all this data. And they're selling that data and statistics and, and whatever. <laughs> uh, but anyway, it's just a, you know, something that's kind of been a recurring uh, discussion. Uh, the role of YouTube, mixed media, hybrid media space, you know, commercial producers and hobbyist sharing ideas. Yeah, you know, this one to me, YouTube to me is just such a, a big deal. Uh, it it would have just been pure, even back in the mid-90s, you know, when I was coming up, it would have been... You you have to be really good at predicting the future, I think, to think that in just that short amount of time we'd actually be uh, able to chat with each other in videos, <laughs> like real time video. Uh, you know, if, if, if when I was in college, if I wanted to make something like I'm making here, uh, I'd have had to go out and get like a Betamax or a you know, camcorder and, and set all that up and record it and. Uh, you know, actually work with tape to, like, cut things up, <laughs> splice stuff together. <laughs> you know, I don't even know how I would do it, to be honest with you. Uh, and then how would I share it? You know, am I going to, you know, copy all these uh, VHS tapes and ship them around or make a DVD? <laughs> this would have been way beyond my technical expertise and not to mention the cost of doing this. Just would have been a non, non-starter, basically. Uh, whereas YouTube... It just makes it so easy. I think we just almost take this for granted how cool this thing is that I could get this in my computer, uh, make a video, uh, record it all, upload it, boom, you're able to watch it, 
you know, it just cuts out so much of the, the cost of that, the, the knowledge I would need. Uh, <clears throat> and I'm not, I'm, not <laughs> you know, I'm not a YouTube uh, uh, sponsor here, but you got to admit that's, that's pretty cool that we can we can do this stuff. Another downside, though, I guess, is that it does sort of change these dynamics between who gets to make, who gets to produce these things, and who gets to control them. Uh, you know, what are, what kind of relationship do you have with your audience or your fans? Uh, this, this things like YouTube make a big difference, right? And then same thing with uh, <clears throat> WordPress and fan fiction. If you think about it, I'll give you an example. We're talking here about Star Trek, but. Uh, one of the examples that stuck with me, and I remember my friends, uh, one of my friends had a brother. <laughs> and we went to this uh, his house one time, and he was showing us these, God, this must have been like 90, 94, maybe 96. Uh, but he had, what he had done, he was part of this little group, I don't even, this was like in Louisiana, probably like around Shreveport, Louisiana. So there's this group of, group of folks that would meet up and they would share their videos. And what they had in their videos was to take clips of movies uh, in his case, he took that scene uh, from Star Wars, Return of the Jedi. Yeah, this scene, this scene here, if you remember it, there's another shot of it. Uh, so he took that scene with these, uh, I want to call them speeder bikes, and he uh, put the song by John Lennon, that Revolution song. You think you want Revolution? You know that one? <laughs> and so you had the speeder bikes and then the music kind of uh, like a music video, basically. And it was a lot of fun. Uh, you know, clearly he was breaking all kinds of copyright laws. You know, he didn't get permission to do any of this. <laughs> uh, but it didn't really matter. No, it's not like he's ever going to be sued because nobody cares. I mean, it's just like this tiny group of folks uh, doing this kind of thing. Uh, it's not like it's costing anybody any... You know, they, they buy the tapes and stuff, but it, nobody is really all that worried about it. <laughs> Frankly, <laughs> you know the same thing with this fan fiction. Uh, Jenkins mentioned zines a few times. Uh, so there, there's always been people, you know, that take the old copy machine Xeroxes, kind of do it yourself, uh, make fan fiction stuff, and just put it out there to a little mailing list. Uh, you might have, uh, you know, maybe a hundred or so people if you're really lucky, uh, reading these zines. Uh, but it's not really worth it. It wasn't worth it for those publishers to come after those folks. Uh, with lawyers, because it just, again, you're talking very little money. <laughs> uh, okay, uh, but it's different now, right? Now that you can put it on YouTube or on a WordPress site, and you might, whereas before it might have been two, three people, now you might be talking about two million people uh, watching that thing. Uh, so now it gets to be a lot more, um, you know, they started taking it a lot more seriously, and I would say there's, I think we're still trying to work out some of the details. And I know we talked about this with Lessig and, and Free Culture. A lot, a lot of the same issues here with remix, remixing and uh, copyleft, Creative Commons, uh, copyright law. I mean, here we have these Star Trek fan productions. And these are, well, first of all, I'm just astounded by how many of these things there are. <laughs> You know, again, these are just fans for the most part. They're not getting paid. Uh, a lot of these folks, uh, sometimes actually paying uh, people to come in and star in these productions. But uh, the point is, these are not professionals. A lot of these are amateurs and hobbyists uh, making films set in the Star Trek universe and putting them out there. One of them even goes back to 1974. That, that's pretty impressive. But nowadays, if we, if we watch these, uh, my guess is, and I haven't, watched any of these to be honest with you but i'm just going to go out on a limb here <laughs> and say that most of these are probably pretty amateurish they're probably uh not so well acted i'm guessing the costumes in the studio the effects <laughs> are pretty lamentable compared to the you know the movies uh, but that's not really true anymore you know as, as time goes on and the uh, video software and all that and the, they're able to pool all these resources together uh, they can put out a show, or a movie even, that looks pretty good. I mean, you wouldn't be able to tell that was a, just an amateur uh, production. Right? You, might think that, you might actually think that's better uh, than the ones that were put out by uh, uh, Paramount. So it, it, there's you know, a lot going on. And then how would you feel about that if you were Paramount? <laughs> you know, if you're a CEO uh, 
of Paramount or whatever, and you're seeing these all these fan productions, uh, you might start thinking, man, we need to like get some of that money. You know, what if uh, they're selling these DVDs? You know, what if you make a fan movie about Star Trek and then you're selling it, uh, selling the Blu-ray or the DVD and making a lot of money, <laughs> uh, but you didn't get any permission from, you know, uh, the studios to do that? Well, they'd probably send the lawyers after you. Uh, but what if, again, it's not, what if they're not selling it? You know, what if it's just there, they sort of put it out there for anybody to, to watch? You know, there's all these things that are still being worked out. Uh, but it does shift. The point that I think Jenkins is making is it's kind of shifting these uh, uh, the culture from just a few people with a lot of resources and a lot of money, like, like a big studio like Paramount. Uh, so they're not the only ones that can make good content anymore. Right now, now you can just have uh, just fans and hobbyists, you know, people that maybe have zero <laughs> uh, training or connections to studios, uh, but yet they're making things that can compete directly with the, the studio production. So that, that's kind of, you can see wh how this is going to have big impacts on, on culture uh, going forward. Uh, Jenkins also talks a lot about transmedia and synergies, he, he, call, he likes that word a lot. So I love this concept personally. And the idea is you have a story that you're trying to tell. And it's such a big story that you don't, you can't just have it told in one medium. You need to have multiple platforms to tell different parts of the story in different ways. Leveraging uh, the strength of these different channels. So I like to use the example of, uh, or he uses the example of The Matrix. I like to think about the Walking Dead series. But really there's a million of these uh, pretty much any comic book <laughs> is like this. Uh, but with the, the Matrix is a pretty good example uh, because that, of course, it's movies. So it starts with the movies. If you want to know about The Matrix, you watch the movies, and that's where a lot of that story gets told. But the Wachowskis um, also made a game, and there's a comic, a manga series, I guess, uh, that goes with this. And uh, the comics and the game, it's not just a rehash of the movies. They actually tell different stories in those comics and in the games that you couldn't get in the movies. So if you want the full story of what happens in the Matrix, now you have to watch the movies, yes, but you also have to read the comics and you have to play that game uh, to fill in all the details. And, you know, and I'm sure there's other examples we could think of. Hamilton is one that uses the soundtrack. Uh, so you, yes, you watch the, the play, or you go to the play, and you see uh, the performance and that's a lot of it, but there's also some songs that are on the soundtrack that aren't performed. You know, they're, they're basically cut out of the, the play. But if you buy the soundtrack, you can hear those songs. And you know, they actually fill in some of the story uh, that's not in the not in the play. So there's a lot of examples of this. And you could think, like, the, walk, the reason I like The Walking Dead so much is that if you play the games, <clears throat> you know, again, they don't just have the same story in the show and the game and the books and comics and whatever. They actually do different things in each. Uh, but the games are cool because they're, you know, they'll give you choices you can make. So periodically in the game, it'll say, do you want to go with this? Do you want to go over here and do this with this character? Or would you rather do that <laughs> with that character? Uh, so they're kind of leveraging that power of the game uh, to tell stories in a different way uh, than just watching a show or a movie. You know, it'd be kind of weird if you're watching The Walking Dead show and periodically it would ask you, <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, why do you want uh, Negan to do at this point? Uh, press A or B. <laughs> yes, I know there are shows like that uh, being made on Netflix uh, as we speak. So it's just kind of interesting, though. Uh, but the point here is just to be thinking about the synergies. And i got to say one more point about this. Uh, from the studio's perspective, this makes a lot of sense because each one of these categories has a different audience. Uh, there are people that play games that couldn't care less, would never walk into a comic book store, for example, and vice versa. <laughs> there are people that love comics uh, that could care less about what's on TV. Uh, there are people that read books that don't care about the movie. Uh, these are different audiences, uh, but you know they all might like The Matrix, or they all might be interested in The Walking Dead. They just want to enter that world. They want to enter that narrative from a different medium. So they, they like people, there's people that just read the novels. <laughs> they're, they're fine with that. Uh, a lot of people, of course, just read the comic and they don't care about the show. Or they don't play the game. Right? So it's, it's kind of different markets, uh, different 
uh, demographics, but it all adds up to that big narrative. All right, convergence. He defines convergence. Uh, and again, Jenkins thinks this isn't just technology. This is a big change to our whole, at least pop culture. Uh, so he says convergence is a, con is a cultural rather than a technological process. Uh, we now live in a world where every story, image, sound, idea, brand, and relationship will play itself out across all media platforms. And we can see this happening every day. You get on Facebook and you see these memes. <laughs> you see uh, people taking all these iconic uh, images and uh, ideas and, and brands. There's, there's going up. You might, it's kind of hectic almost, right? It's, it's all, all this stuff coming together. Uh, and the, I wouldn't say that any, you know, Nike, uh, they might not like that <laughs> meme or whatever it is. <laughs> uh, but they might not even have the power to do anything about it, right? So. Uh, there's a lot of forces converging uh, right now. All right, another concept here is collective intelligence. And this is another one of these really cool concepts. just kind of blows your mind when you think about it. And he talks a little bit about uh, this book. Do I have it here? Yeah, Everything Bad is Good for You, Stephen Johnson. Now, one of the things I like about this book, I just have to mention this because it's such a great argument. Uh, Johnson says that a lot changed about television when it got to be possible to easily record things and stream things like TiVo, Netflix, you know, services like that. Uh, a lot of things began to change about television shows. Uh, when I was growing up, you know, you didn't have a way to record anything. If you wanted a VCR, unless you were rich, <laughs> you went to the video store and you had to rent the movies and then you had to rent a VCR. You know, people weren't, like, recording shows on TV and watching them uh, when they wanted to. Again, let's, this began to change, but at least when I was a kid, that was the reality. Uh, so the, what that meant was that the TV shows had to be, I don't know about had to be, but just to kind of fit that model, uh, they had to be relatively simple. You just had episodes where you could watch them out of order. So if you missed a week, it wasn't a big deal. You know, you're not going to miss out too much. You can just watch the next episode. You'll be fine. <laughs> And so the story arcs and the, the stuff happening in the episodes was relatively simple. Uh, what Johnson says, though, is once it got to be possible to easily record things and watch it, and again, TiVo and, of course, now Netflix, uh, you can really make these shows complicated because if you need to, you can always pause it, you can rewind it, you know, you can watch it two or three times and pick up on things you didn't notice the first time. So now you get these shows. You know, when I was a, a kid, you're watching things like A-Team. <laughs> Uh, now, it, or like the old Battlestar Galactica, oh my God. You know, very simple, straightforward stories, you know, to put it kindly. Uh, whereas nowadays, you get things like the real, uh, or the good uh, Battlestar Galactica that's you know, super complex. Or, or look at Game of Thrones. I mean, my goodness. Uh, you, you practically need to take notes <laughs> as you're watching this thing to try to keep up with, like, oh my God, who's this again? You know, it, 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 it's a really intellectually demanding uh situation so that's why Stephen Johnson says that yeah you know people used to talk about couch potatoes and TV dumbing you down but things have changed according to Johnson you know Johnson would say if you look at Game of Thrones shows like that they're really kind of a, almost a mental workout uh, just trying to keep track of what what the heck's going on uh, some other examples so that's what um let me uh, back up a little bit here to talk about collective intelligence so these shows are more complex and part of that means that you can have discussions about them. So, again, the when I was a kid, you know, you might be talking to your friends about it. Uh, nowadays, you can get online and go to Reddit. Uh, an example here from Reddit, and I won't show you the, that for just a split second just to show you that it exists, but I don't want to spoil it. <laughs> uh, but they're talking about this uh, show, The Squid Game, or Squid Games. Is it Squid Game? Anyway. And kind of some mysterious stuff happens in that show. It's not really, uh, everything's not spelled out really clearly. Uh, there's some kind of, uh, you watch it and you're like, hmm, what's going on with that? So you can get on Reddit and you can see there's like thousands of people that have already joined these discussions and they're, you know, basically trying to argue amongst themselves about, uh, you know, what does this mean? Or what's happening here? <laughs> what's season two going to be like? And, and so on and so forth. And they can, they do that with all these, uh, all these shows, uh, Jenkins talks about this Survivor show, if you remember that one. 
Uh, it almost got scientific. <laughs> I mean, it's like the CIA level of uh, research and investigations they were doing to like try to you know, like using Google uh, satellite images, <laughs> you know, all of this stuff to try to you know figure out who's going to be the uh, last one standing or who, who's going to win this show. Uh, so they, they really kind of pulled all the resources together. And I put games here because this is one that, uh, you know, I'm more familiar with. But if you take something like uh, World, of, World of Warcraft or an online game of some sort, uh, it can be very intimidating just as an individual, you know, to try to figure out, like, how do I win this? Or what's a good strategy? What's some good, you know, how do I get the best gear and so on and so forth? Or what do I, I'm, I'm stuck here at this part. <laughs> you know, I can't get past this. Uh, so a lot of people will get online nowadays because you have all these discussions. You have these walkthroughs that people have produced. You can have, again, Reddit's one that comes up a lot. And you can, or on Steam, you know, the Steam uh, has these discussions that go along with each game uh, where people talk about, you know, what do you do here? Or, Here's a problem I'm having there. Uh, so they can sort of pool their resources because maybe not everybody knows, no one person knows everything. But if you got hundreds of people, there's a good chance at least one person out of that crowd knows the answer. <laughs> so that's kind of how this works. It's uh, the same principles behind Wikipedia, for example. Okay, so to wrap up here, <clears throat> uh, participatory culture then, that's another one of Jenkins' big concepts. Uh, for something to be a participatory culture, you need relatively low barriers to artistic expression and civic engagement. So we can check that box for something like YouTube. You know, you could do basically with your phone. Uh, you could record a video, upload it to YouTube. It's not all that technologically demanding. Um, much lower barriers than it would have been back in the 80s or the 90s to make a TV show. You know, just consider that. <laughs> it's, the, it's much easier to make a video these days than it was back then. Uh, same thing with uh, engaging with others about it. Uh, strong support for creating and sharing one's creations. Uh, so a good example of this that Jenkins uses is fan fiction. Uh, he talks a lot about the Harry Potter phenomenon. Um, he's got pretty good evidence, I think, that, uh, you know, for these kids, a lot of them are kids. Some are, you know, a lot of adults, too, of course. But, uh, you know, they, they read Harry Potter or some, you know, stories they like, and they want to uh, write their own stories, you know, with those characters. And so they get, they put, they get on these uh, fan fiction sites and they post those stories you know, it's not too hard technologically speaking, uh, but the more important piece here is the uh, informal mentorship. Uh, so, I think you know, if you think about the difference between, you know, being in school and you write this essay for the teacher, you know, the teacher reads it, but that's, you know, that's pretty much where, the, where it ends, right? <laughs> uh, whereas these kids, you know, they can write a fun story and they can put it on the, on the fan fiction site and then they got all these other fans that are reading it and they're talking about it. Uh, conversing, maybe they write a story that follows up or like the next chapter of your story. <laughs> you know, so the, there's a lot of creating and sharing that, that's happening that's very exciting. Uh, so even if you don't make money, you know, writing the story, you still get something out of it. But you, you get the, uh, you know, the, the comments from other people, you get the feedback. Uh, and the mentorship is a really cool piece of this too. Uh, I think especially, you know, just as a composition. You know, as an English professor, I love this idea. Uh, that you write these stories and you write, you post them to the website and then maybe you've got some problems or maybe your structure is not so great or whatever the case may be. Uh, but now you got people coming in to like, hey, here's some advice for you. You know, why don't you try this and that? You know, it's kind of this uh, mentorship process. And I think it's uh, probably true uh, that people learn better from that in that way <laughs> than they would just by you know, a teacher in a classroom giving you some, some rules for writing, you know, or saying, you did that wrong, X. <laughs> you know, 10 points, docked. Uh, maybe you'd rather learn how to write, or maybe you could learn to write just through one of these sort of informal mentorship uh, programs. And we talked about that, too, with Wikipedia and how if you want to be a Wikipedia editor, you can get in those discussions and work with people that have been doing it a long time, and they're willing to help you out, help you get started. Uh, give you advice and feedback, and that's really uh, critical. Okay. <clears throat> uh, consumers making things. Yes, we talked about fan fiction. Uh, we talked about fan movies. Still kind of mind-boggling. Mind uh, I wanted to add a couple other ones here. 
uh, modding and user generated content. So you see this a lot, of course, in the game world. So the you've got a lot of games actually start off as being uh, levels or mods, they call it, of an existing game. So the uh, you could take a game like, uh, what was it, uh, Half-Life, I think, and they made a game, Counter-Strike. <laughs> One example, I, I think I'm remembering that correctly, couldn't be wrong. Uh, but anyway, a lot of these games that come out these days will have a, they'll call it a, a modding kit or a construction kit, something like that. You can actually make uh, your own levels or your own... Uh, you know, stories uh, using that same game engine and you can share those with your friends it's kind of exciting to have people to do that and it's a whole big exploding phenomenon these days so it's not like just because you're gaming doesn't mean it's all just playing the game uh, you might actually be creating stuff you know, so there's like a creative element production element uh, that wasn't really there before uh, machinima uh, this to uh, come back to our world of warcraft example so you could get together with your friends on wow and say let's do uh you know i wrote this script <laughs> for a little story uh you know let's get together let's get our characters together and this we'll meet at this certain place and we'll record this little play that we'll put on uh, kind of make a little animated movie basically and then put that on youtube a lot of people do that sort of thing it's a lot of fun uh but again it's, it's kind of a creative thing going on there uh, and then finally con links this is one of my favorite topics so you might be aware of you know, if you watch Game of Thrones, for example, or, or you watch uh, a Reed Tolkien or watch uh, Star Trek, you know, they have languages in there like Klingon and Elvish, Dothraki, and so on and so forth. And these are sort of made-up fictional languages. But a lot of the fans uh, like this stuff so much. They'll actually learn these languages, and then they want to start using them for various purposes in real life. Uh, so people might want to get married in Klingon. Or they might want to write a story or translate uh, the Bible. Uh, for some reason, that ha happens a lot. <laughs> uh, translate the Bible or the Bill of Rights or something uh, into these other, you know, sort of fictional languages. Uh, so people are doing that kind of work that, you know, the creators of those con langs, like the people that wrote, created Klingon, probably <laughs> had no intention uh, of this ever happening. But, you know, they probably think it's kind of cool. But the, a lot of times what happens is you might not have a word for that. You know, the Klingon Dictionary probably doesn't have a word for everything you would need to do this wedding ceremony. Uh, so they just, the fans have to kind of make up some words sometimes. Uh, so that's, again, it's not all just passively consuming things. Uh, the fans are actually adding to it, building on it, creating stuff of their own. All right, so some problems and opportunities of all of this. Uh, you know, we talked about a few, uh, and you know, if you're, you know, if you're a CEO running one of these studios, or you're an author writing things, or making movies, or whatever the case may be, this is kind of a double-edged sword, in a lot of ways, right? Because, you know, on the one hand, it's kind of cool if you write this story, you create this universe, and then you got all these fans doing stuff with it. Uh, you might think that's really cool. I'm really proud. <laughs> you know, look, I did that. Uh, on the other hand, you're kind of lose, ceding some control over it, right? Maybe you don't want that particular group over there using your images or using your music or using your uh, game engine to do whatever it is they're doing. Uh, a lot of the stuff, frankly, is very inappropriate, you know, not just in terms of not safe for work, uh, but you might just like, I don't want to be associated associated with I don't want to be associated in any way with that group over there that's trying to use my uh, my stuff, my content. You know, you know, these memes and spoofs and so on and so forth. So there's some issues around that. Uh, obviously, the, the copyright stuff is just really hectic. You know, we talked about that with Lessig and just how, uh, you know, the company might want to say, I don't want you using Klingon. And there actually was a lawsuit where they were trying to sue people for using Klingon. And I don't know if it went to the Supreme Court. or It might, it might have actually gone all the way to the Supreme Court. I don't know. Uh, but they, I think they eventually just settled it out of court and said, you know, fine, whatever. Uh, it's a language here. Uh, but the problem is sometimes you can, if you clamp down too hard on the fans and say you can't do that or take all that down, uh, the fans might actually get pissed off. And then they... Uh, 
collective intelligence again. And then, then they're on Reddit saying, boycott, you know, the studio or don't watch this movie or don't do that. <laughs> you know, burn the books. I don't know. Uh, so that, it can actually come back to, to bite you, right? So you, there's some kind of middle ground you have to find there uh, so that you can benefit as much as possible and not suffer the wrath <laughs> of the fans. Uh, and then finally, a question of can you move beyond just, uh, you know, these fandoms, they might really love Harry Potter or whatever. Uh, can you, uh, coming back to culture, sort of big picture stuff again, uh, is, this, is there activism in their interests or creativity? Is it just limited to that sort of fictional world? Uh, or can they be, uh, you know, can we harness some of this energy and apply it towards real life? Uh, issues like this fandom forward thing uh they take uh this used to be, i forget what this used to be called yeah the harry potter alliance uh, so there was a group of you know very dedicated harry potter fans that decided hey look we're all here we've got the collective intelligence we've got these big uh, websites these online communities why don't we see if we can you know pool our resources for some real life you know, changes uh, so that was fandom forward and there's a lot of other movement similar to that <laughs> anyway a lot of material here hope you enjoyed this i'd love to hear your thoughts on all this your questions if you have any but i will see you next time